Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Uh, I'm here tonight uh, because uh, I belong to a group that has somewhat dubious historical origins. Uh, early practitioners of my tradition often claimed to have access to supernatural powers uh, and to possess esoteric knowledge that was only granted to the worthy. Uh, as a result, they typically communicated their messages in cryptic allegorical parables so as to hide this message from the uninitiated. Uh, and early adherents of this tradition were persecuted and marginalized uh, before ultimately gaining acceptance in the wider world. And I'm of course speaking here of my heritage as a chemist. <laughs> I'm judging from your action, I think some of you are expecting me to say something else. But you see, chemistry finds its historical origins in the study of alchemy. Uh, and alchemists believe some pretty strange things. Uh, so for example, here at the top, this is Jabir ibn Hayyan. He was an 8th century Arab alchemist. Uh, and he made a number of important contributions. So he uh, detailed the first synthesis of citric acid uh, and also gave the first description of the crystallization of chemical compounds. He also gave the first description of how you can synthesize snakes and scorpions from inanimate matter. <laughs> uh, this is Roger Bacon, uh, an important 13th century alchemist. He uh, proposed the first Western recipe for gunpowder, also the first Western recipe for turning lead into gold. Uh, and so it seems strange uh, that, to the modern mind at least, that these two disciplines, alchemy and chemistry, that they grew up together, uh, but in fact they did. And, in, and it might make more sense when we realize that our sort of archetype for a chemist uh, is someone who wears a funny coat and mixes chemicals in a strange container. Uh, and our al archetype for an alchemist is also someone who wears a funny coat and mixes chemicals in a strange container. <laughs> uh, it's just that the person on the right is a chemist and the person on the left is a wizard. Uh, and so it took centuries for chemistry to free itself from the spurious in influence of alchemy. And, this, and I'm also a Christian, and the historical narrative of Christianity is eerily similar to this. Uh, so historically, uh, Christianity, uh, has, in all religion, has had to work to disentangle itself from mythology on the one hand and superstition on the other. So mythology uh, is the invention of fictional tales in order to explain material events for which there is no satisfactory explanation. So if you see a thunderbolt, you, invite, you, inv you invent a fictional god named Zeus who wields that power. Superstition, uh, on the other hand, uh, is the belief that one type of event causes another type of event uh, in a way that runs contrary to reason and observation. So the example here is if you break a mirror, there, it's supposed to, superstition tells you that will bring you seven years of bad luck. Now, historically, science has been one of the key tools by which we expunge mythology and superstition from religious practice. So, for example, we can test what happens if you break a mirror. Uh, do you actually get seven years of bad luck? What if you break a hand mirror? Is that still seven years or do you only get six months for that? How does the amount of bad luck scale with the size of the mirror? These are scientific questions that we can use to try to expunge things like superstition. But then the question becomes, after applying the scalpel of science to faith, is there anything left? Or is the only thing that's left behind science? Does it explain everything? And that's what I want us to talk about tonight. Is science enough? And lurking behind this question of whether science is enough is a particular philosophy uh, that is known as uh, metaphysical, metaphysical naturalism. Uh, and uh, to, to say it bluntly, metaphysical naturalism is the conviction that the natural world is all there is. Uh, and now, if this were true, it would certainly imply that, yes, science ought to be enough. Because if the physical world is all there is, then one, only, one can only search for scientific answers, explanations of physical events in terms of natural causes. Supernatural things like gods or angels or demons don't exist and therefore can hardly be used as explanations for anything. Now, contrarywise, if it turns out that in some sense science is incomplete, that casts doubt on the fundamental tenet of naturalism, which is that the natural world is all there is. And so in discussing this, I think there are really two slightly different questions that are being asked here. So on the one hand, we want to know if science is enough to explain all the evidence that we see. And then on the other hand, we want to know if science is enough to be a kind of life philosophy, that over, an overarching philosophy that guides our lives. So I want to discuss each of these questions in turn. So first, is science enough to explain all the evidence we see? 
Well, here we need to realize that while science does give explanations for all physical evidence, it, it only gives us one kind of explanation, no matter what question we ask. It gives us an explanation that is in terms of efficient physical causes. And what we need to decide is if that answer is complete and satisfactory. So for example, uh, let's consider the following question. Uh, is the, oh, it's cut off there, sorry. That, so it says, is the universe governed by random chance? So uh, that's the question we want to think about. Is the universe governed by random chance? Well, there are different ways I could answer this question depending on the sort of layer of meaning that I'm looking for. So for example, I could give a scientific explanation for this. Uh, so as a chemist, I note that there is a variable known as entropy that measures the amount of disorder or the amount of randomness in a system. And we have a law, which is the second law of thermodynamics, that says that the universe, or at least the part of it we can observe, displays an inexorable drive from order toward disorder. So entropy increases. And this drive towards higher entropy or higher randomness can be used to explain countless chemical and scientific phenomena, things like why ice cubes melt, why iron rusts, why balloons deflate. And so in a scientific uh, sense, the answer to this question might be yes. The universe is largely governed by random chance. But on the other hand, we could ask this question uh, in the sense of asking whether the universe is random in the sense of being haphazard or having no purpose. Uh, now, purpose is an idea that exists outside uh, of the tangible physical order. And so you can't touch it, you can't feel it, you can't see it. According to metaphysical naturalism then, asking a question about purpose makes no sense. Only the mechanistic explanation is real. But from a th theological perspective, the existence of order is one of the most powerful arguments for the existence of God. The argument goes like this, we observe that the universe is tending from a state of order toward one of disorder, so the natural question is, where did that initial order come from? Uh, to put it in a more colloquial sense, uh, your dorm room uh, may have a tendency to go from uh, a state like this toward a state like that. Uh, but if you walked into a dorm room and found that it had originally been placed in a, in a state like that, you would naturally assume that there was someone who had, who had set it up that way to begin with. You could probably even infer something about their character, what they're interested in, what they're like. And so, in this context, the theological answer to the question of whether the universe is governed by random chance might be no. The universe isn't governed by random chance. It, it started out ordered, and that's because there is some God animating and ordering things behind it. And so we see that while science can, in some sense, explain all the evidence, the explanations of science could be incomplete. They might not be enough for us. They only ever explain part of what we might want to know about the phenomenon, and we're left with this feeling that there might be something more. Okay, so that was the first question. Is it enough to explain all evidence? Uh, the second question is, is science enough to be a, li a life philosophy? So the idea here is, can I use science to guide my decisions, my choices, and my actions? And in particular, can I do that in a way that doesn't depend on faith? Well, in this endeavor, we immediately run into a problem because scientific evidence is always incomplete. Uh, in pure mathematics, uh, evidence is enough to lead to certainty. You know, we have a proof of Fermat's last theorem. We're sure that it's true. We are certain. But by contrast, in science, we're pretty sure the standard mo model of particle physics is right. We've got a lot of evidence, but we're not quite certain it's true. Because no matter how much scientific evidence we gather, there's always more data we could collect, and that data could change our conclusion. That's why we keep collecting data in the first place. And it's this lack of certainty that's a problem, because if we, it becomes a problem if we want to make science our life philosophy. Because we don't have certainty, and it leads us to indecision and inaction. So in life, I would contend that we actually operate with a different criterion for, for certainty. And so to highlight that, I have uh, an illustration here. Uh, so, uh, so I'm going to suppose that we have a friend here, Sally. Sally, she likes hiking. And she's out hiking and she's hungry. She consumed all of her trail mix a couple of, uh, a couple of miles back and she's still several hours from making base camp. Uh, but fortunately, Sally notices that across a deep valley, uh, there is a delicious plate of bacon. <laughs> and now while science and faith are not an either or decision, bacon is definitely either or. Either you like bacon or you're wrong. I guess Sally's not Jewish, but... Uh, <laughs> so, um, 
So Sally's really hungry, and she really wants the bacon, but she can't hike to the other side of the valley. It's too far for her to jump, and the, the canyon walls are too, too steep for her to hike down. Fortunately, she notices that, that there's a bridge, and she has to decide if she's going to cross the bridge or not. And unfortunately for Sally, this is a rather sleazy looking bridge. Uh, you know, some of the slats appear to be kind of missing, the rope is frayed, and she has to decide uh, if, and what we have to decide is, well, will the bridge hold Sally if she attempts to cross, or will the bridge collapse, leaving her to plunge to her death? She might think it will hold her, but how can she be certain? Well, the bridge uh, gives us the ultimate definitive test of certainty in life, uh, because if Sally attempts to cross the bridge, it indicates that she is certain the bridge will hold her. Uh, unless she is suicidal, she would have no motivation to step on a bridge that she thought would not support her. Likewise, if she chooses not to cross the bridge, then that proves that she is not certain that the bridge will hold her. And ultimately, I think this is the key measure of certainty. Uh, certainty is certainty to act. Now, this kind of certainty is not the same as the absence of doubt. Uh, Sally might very, have very valid doubts about whether the bridge will hold her. But if she chooses to cross, then along with the evidence that she sees, Sally experiences something else. You might call it conviction. You might call it assurance. I'm calling it certainty. She experiences something else that motivates her to act. And having that kind of certainty requires faith. Because as we saw, science gives us greater and greater confidence in a proposition, but it can never get us all the way across the gap from indecision to certainty. It might leave a big gap, or it might leave a small gap, but there's always a gap. The last step across that gap is the step of faith. Now, this need not be religious faith. Uh, we can have faith in the goodness of humanity, faith in a person, faith in the law of gravity. But faith is the thing that leads to decisive action. Uh, we need that in order to make the decision. And so by itself, science doesn't form a life philosophy. You need some form of faith to go along with science in order to make decisions. And so is science enough? Okay, well, I'm arguing that it's not enough by itself. And so if science isn't enough, what is? Uh, what's enough? Well, in my experience, Science coupled with Christian faith provides a, a reasonable uh, worldview for, for, for filling some of these criteria. So the Christian, Christian thought provides explanations of the physical world that are complementary to the scientific des descriptions. And Christianity also gives me motivation to act in the light of scientific evidence. Uh, and it's this last point that's really important to me because I've noticed a peculiar flaw in my character. You know, because I have a lot of moral maxims that I'm, I'm really sure are true. You know, things like do unto others as you would have others do unto you, or turn the other cheek, or tell the truth. And yet I'm constantly disappointed by my inability to act according to those principles. For example, when I was in high school, I was a geek. Now, <laughs> I know, I know, it's shocking. You're probably thinking, hmm, MI, quantum chemistry professor at MIT, and you were a geek in high school? Get out of town. <laughs> but it's true, in high school I was tall, I was scrawny, I was socially awkward, and I was too smart for my own good. <laughs> but instead of embracing my inner geek, in my heart of hearts, what I really wanted was to be cool, to be one of the popular kids. And it didn't make me a very nice person. Uh, Instead, it caused me to shun people who I perceived to be lower on the social ladder than I was, all the other people who didn't have enough money to buy the right clothes, or all the other members of my chemistry Olympiad team, <laughs> who, in my defense, were much nerdier than I was. And I faced the same kind of scenario time and again. I want things. I want good grades. I want success in my career. I want wealth. I want fame. And I know that none of them is going to make me a particularly good person. I even suspect that none of them is going to make me a very happy person. But I want them just the same. Because the problem isn't high school or the popular kids or acad college or academia. The problem is me, the way that I am and the things that I want. And no matter how hard I work, that's never a problem that I can solve because I am the problem. You see, I don't just need to learn truth. I don't need to just find out right from wrong or to learn how many bones there are in the human body. I need truth that has the power to change the way that I am. And faith in God can do this. Now, faith in a watchmaker God doesn't do that. If God is merely the one who set the universe in motion and then he hung up a sign saying, be back in 25 billion years, if that's all God is, then I'm stuck. Uh, whatever I am is whatever I am. 
Meanwhile, most religions are even less help on this point because they tie our acceptance by God uh, to our accomplishments, to our, ability to, adhere, to our ability to adhere to a set of rules or accomplish a handful of tasks. Only in Christianity does God provide the means for us to change who we are. See, as Christians, we're convinced that when we place our faith in Christ, then the person of Jesus, who was raised from the dead, comes to live in us. And fundamentally, what I believe in is pow Jesus' power to change me, to change who I am. I believe that the same God who set the universe, because if the same God who set the universe in motion, who, who works in and through the natural laws, if that same God provided the means, the bridge that allows us to get from who we are to who we were meant to be, that to me is enough. Thank you very much. So I'm very grateful, first of all, to be invited to speak here. Um, and I'm also grateful to you for coming. And the first thing I want to do, actually, now that I have how many minutes, 20 minutes, uh, to respond is, uh, it's actually not a response so much as an introduction. Uh, I thought I would do things a little bit differently than the way they're usually done, I guess, in these debates. But for that, I need uh, some equipment. I'll be right back. So rather than debating things the usual way, <laughs> I thought we would, uh, we would debate them the, okay, fine, maybe I'll put this. Although actually boxing with a Christian is wonderful because if you land a jab, then the cross is for free and the book is for free. <laughs> Um, okay, so let me start by telling you a little bit about, uh, about me. <laughs> so I first heard of Veritas um, when I was talking to my friend, Satyan, and uh, who is also my colleague in the math department. And he mentioned it in a conversation that he had participated in these sorts of debates. And my first question was, what qualifies you <laughs> to participate in this debate? What sort of expertise do you have that qualifies you to do this? So for example, I would never presume to discuss the Bible or quantum mechanics or things that I don't understand. But of course, here I am right now, so here we go. So, um, <laughs> uh, so what expertise do I have? And the answer is, I, I don't. I don't have any expertise. Even within mathematics, my expertise is quite limited. Uh, the only thing I can really talk about is my worldview and my life experience. And basically, it's very egotistical, me, and also what I've observed amongst my friends, amongst people whom I've known but haven't had a chance to be friends with, amongst my family. Um, so let me start by telling you a little bit about my background, just so you know how I arrived where, where I am now. Uh, I was born to uh, Russian parents, Russian immigrant parents, um, and they were Jewish, but in fact they were Jewish not in the standard North American way, they are Jewish uh, ethnically, which means in the following sense, that uh, my father is an atheist, my mother is effectively an atheist, she believes in superstitions, but, um, and actually the past five generations of my family were each born in a different country, and most of them were not religious. The only connecting thread is that they're all Jews. So in that sense, I'm ethnically Jewish. Um, but I did grow up with some Jewish cultural baggage heritage. Um, and when my parents moved, yeah, guilt, uh, primarily, uh, when my parents moved to the US, they wanted to give me an opportunity that they didn't have in the USSR. In the USSR, uh, atheism was required. Um, so actually people weren't allowed to practice their religions. Uh, so my parents wanted to give me the chance to explore religion and come up with my own conclusions. So when I was a kid, they signed me up for uh, Hebrew classes and just general Jewish classes, I guess. We met once a week. We studied uh, 
we studied all sorts of things. Um, we studied the Torah, we studied uh, uh, the Talmud, we learned some Hebrew. Um, basically what I remember from these classes is the Hebrew words for dog and house. Uh, there's this cute girl in the class, I don't remember her name though, but she was cool. Um, I remember that the teacher referred to eunuchs as snippets. That made a big impression on me, I thought that was really hilarious. Um, and also, fun fact, uh, the weekly lessons happened at B.J. Novak's house. Uh, B.J. Novak is the executive producer of the, or was the executive producer of The Office, and also was Ryan the Temp on The Office. And anyway, he, uh, I'm from the same hometown in Newton, Massachusetts. Um, so I went through all of this stuff, and as you can see, I didn't remember very much of it, so certainly no expertise from that. Um, and by the time I was an early teenager, I had pretty much decided that actually my parents were on the right side of the fence and I wasn't, I wasn't feeling religion. I wasn't convinced. It was interesting to learn about, sort of as a historical phenomenon, but I just, it wasn't for me. Um, but I was still curious and so I, I still poked around, I had conversations with people and in my parents' household, my dad is actually very interested in uh, religion and philosophy and anthropology and uh, he had a bunch of books lying around, and so I'd read some of these books. And in particular, we had a New Testament with this really cool feature. Everything that Jesus said was in red ink, and everything else was in black ink. And uh, I guess when I was around 15 or 16, I picked it up, and I started reading it out of curiosity. And I found something funny, which is that most of the stuff in red ink I thought was really cool and interesting, and most of the stuff in the, that was in black ink I didn't think was as interesting or as cool. Um, so what I drew from that was that uh, Jesus must have been quite an interesting guy. Uh, and um, I still sort of, I have a lot of respect for a lot of, uh, a lot of the things that I read in there. Um, but nonetheless, a lot of the black parts, which are most of, most of it, uh, didn't inspire me in the slightest. And in fact, I found a lot of them a little bit weird uh, and bizarre. Um, and so when I arrived to college, I went to Princeton for undergrad, as Sethian mentioned. When I arrived to college, I arrived with the full conviction that no intelligent, reasonable person could possibly believe all this mumbo jumbo. No intelligent person could possibly be a Christian. My sophomore year, I lived down the hall from this guy named John, and I met him. We became very close friends very quickly. And as it happens, he was an evangelical Christian from Indiana, actually, which is where Troy is from as well. Uh, and we had many long nights where we would debate until four in the morning about all sorts of things. And it was a wonderful year for me. First of all, we became lifelong friends. He's still one of my closest friends to this day. Um, but the other thing that I learned, which was very, very important for me, it was eye-opening, is that you can actually be a reasonable and intelligent person and be a Christian. There's no conflict in that. Um, now, for you, that might be obvious, but for me, that was not in any way obvious. I'd never met a religious Christian, a truly religious Christian, until I got to college. Um, so for me, this was, this was a shock. Um, but I really learned that. I really uh, internalized this. And actually, I was kind of curious. I saw John over spring break in New York, and we were hanging out, and I asked him what he learned over that year. And so what he told me was that he had the exact opposite realization. He had always assumed that any intelligent, reasonable person, if only they were exposed to Christianity, if only they really understood what it was about, how could they not accept it? How could they not see it as a self-evident truth? But over the course of the year, he came to understand that that wasn't the case. So for both of us, this year was a really eye-opening experience. We both became, I think, a lot more mature and open as a result of it. So that was a very important year for me. Um, so, Let's see. So one of the, uh, so in many ways I should say that my, my viewpoint, my worldview is very similar to a lot of the Christians that I met. So I became very close friends with John. I also became close friends with a few other members of his Christian fellowship. Uh, and my junior year I ended up living in an apartment with uh, three guys from the same Christian fellowship. And so I really got to see a lot of the ways in which they think about religion or Christianity specifically, the way they they interact with it the way they interact with each other and other people. Um, and it was great for me, again, because I really saw that in many ways we aligned. There is a lot of common ground. So, for example, uh, we have very similar ideas of morality. Very, very similar. 
And we were both awestruck by the wonders of nature. They're all studying different things, but all of us had this in common. There's something amazing about nature. You know, when uh, I still remember when I was, I was in Israel over the summer, and we we're in uh, the desert in the Negev at night. And you look up, there are no lights anywhere for 100 miles around, except for the secret nuclear reactor in Dimona, but whatever. Um, so there are no lights for mi hundreds of miles around. And you look up at the sky, and all you could see so many stars in this incredible Milky Way. And you didn't have to look for the Milky Way, it was just there. It was awe-inspiring and beautiful and amazing. Of course, the difference in my wonder at nature and John's wonder at nature was that I didn't see God there. I saw this incredible beauty, and it made me feel like I was connected to something much bigger than myself. And that's a wonderful feeling. And I think, actually, my impression is that John felt the same way, but he felt connected to God in a certain way. Um, so we shared a similar feeling, a similar sort of experience, I think. I can't, I can't measure that. Um, but it was on, for different reasons, fundamentally. Um, another thing that I had in common with John and with uh, these other guys that I lived with was that we were very introspective. We were constantly striving to improve ourselves and to understand what it was that wasn't ideal in our natures. How could we be better people? Um, the difference, of course, being that I didn't necessarily see that as a as a, the change had to come through Christ or through religion, I just, I would look at myself and say, well, listen, I'm sure there are plenty of bad things I don't see, but I do see that you did this thing. Why did you do it? How could you have done it differently? Is there any way you could have different, done it differently? So, um, one thing that I will say in response to Troy's original comments is Troy discussed completeness uh, and certainty versus inaction. So one principle that I really hold very dear is actually that there is no certainty. And that doesn't frighten me. I think it's a wonderful thing. I think it's fun. It's actually exciting not to be certain of anything. You're constantly playing around. You're exploring. There's so much to discover. I love being uncertain about things. Now, I have different levels of confidence about different topics because there's been different amounts of evidence for them. So, for example, people used to have this flat earth theory, right? For a long time, people were convinced the earth was flat. And they're actually pretty close to being right. The curvature of the earth is extremely small. It was a good theory. It wasn't totally wrong. And this is something people, I think, are mistaken about. This, just because the theory wasn't completely correct doesn't mean it was completely wrong. It's not a dichotomy. They're pretty much on the ball, and for many, many predictions, Flat Earth works very well. But for some predictions, for example, if you're crossing the ocean, if you're going over enormous distances, suddenly the curvature of the Earth actually plays a role. So then people eventually were led to the conclusion for various, there are many, many good, very good reasons why they were led to this conclusion, that the Earth could not be flat. So then there's this idea that it has to be some other shape, spherical. Turns out that's also incomplete. And people thought it was spherical because, for example, we looked at the moon, and the moon is a perfect circle, and the sun is a perfect circle. And so we figured, well, that must be that we're also spherical. Turns out that's not quite right either, because when we saw other planets like Jupiter, it turns out it's not a sphere. It's a little bit, it's an oblong, it's stretched out because it spins around, and it ends up being a little bit wider at the equator. Some of its diameters are longer than others. And so then we started thinking about the Earth. Is, it, is the Earth really a sphere, or is it a pair? Right? What, how is it actually shaped? And it turns out a more accurate way to describe it is that it's not a sphere. It's this like weird bulgy, bulging sphere. Um, now, does that mean it's totally wrong or that that's totally certain? I don't know. It's certainly not certain. <laughs> that's the one thing I know because we've already seen that our theory is incomplete. But we get closer and closer to something. I think that's very, very important. I think that's an important way of life. That's an important way of approaching science and just in general internalizing and interpreting what happens around us. Now, one of Troy's points was that if you don't have certainty, that leads to inaction. And I'd like to respectfully disagree. I think when you're confronted with a situation in which you have to act, you choose what you're more confident about. You don't have to be certain to act but you have to choose. So you choose one way, and we're constantly making choices. Where do those choices come from? Are they always scientific? No, of course not. We're very illogical beings. 
I have all sorts of crazy things that I believe in with no good reason, but I'm not even aware of them for the most part. I'm trying to become more cognizant of them. I think that's one of my life's great sort of goals, is to become as conscious as I can of the things that I take for granted. And I want to take as few things for granted as possible. And that allows me, I think, to understand myself better and to enjoy the universe better and interact with other people better. In general, I don't like absolutes. And let me finish, maybe. How much more time do I have? Okay, so I'm done, but I'm going to finish by saying something else. Um, <laughs> so um, let me say that within religion and within Christianity, I think also there are very few absolutes. And this is one of the reasons why I actually get along so well with John and other Christians that I've met. I think that implicit in Christianity, there's a change in the way we think about things. Now, I can't discuss the Bible in great detail, but one thing that I can say is that a lot of interpretations of what the Bible says have changed drastically. So, for example, uh, you know, there, these are famous examples, but for exa especially, by the way, I should say the Old Testament really has a lot of things that now we would just consider highly immoral. Um, for example, it says in uh, Deuteronomy that if, you're, if you discover that your wife is not a virgin on the wedding night, then you're supposed to stone her to death on her father's doorstep. So you're, you're commanded to do this. Um, I think most of us would agree that that's an immoral action now, uh, not to mention um, not practical. Um, <laughs> it also says in the book of Proverbs that children are supposed to be, be beaten with rods. Children are supposed to be beaten with rods. I think, again, a lot of us would agree that that's, that's not a particularly moral practice for our time. Uh, and the final thing that I'll mention, because those are both Old Testament things, New Testament things, there, there are a lot of these things, and I'm not an expert, so I don't want to dwell on them. Um, but uh, in the New Testament, and this is a contentious issue, but it's really not clear what the relationship with slavery is. So, for example, in Colossians, in Timothy, um, you have all sorts of indications that slavery is actually kind of okay. Uh, Jesus never says, as far as I know, and I'd love to be corrected, as far as I know, Jesus never says anything against slavery. He certainly knew that it was around. It was part of life. Why didn't he say anything against it? And I actually don't judge people in that time for having that morality. I think it's immoral now, these positions. But I think morality doesn't mean anything without context. It's very hard, I think, without the context, to know what's right and what's wrong. So all we can do, and all I try to do in my life, is I try to establish, did I behave correctly within a certain context or not? Was that the right thing to do in that context? Is it right to steal? Generally, no. But what if you're on the verge of death? Is it right to steal then? I don't know the answer to that. But it's certainly not obvious to me. So I'm going to end with this, uh, this question of context and the idea of sort of living maybe in a scientific way in the sense that nothing is exactly certain. You keep asking questions of the things that you take for granted and you try to understand everything and everyone, including yourself, better and better to a higher and higher confidence level. Thank you very much. Thanks, Leo. Um, I'm just gonna, thought I'd just start by asking uh, Troy a question, just give Leo a chance to catch up and drink some water and stuff. Um, I'm gonna ask each of these guys a question, maybe have them ask questions to each other, and uh, then maybe we can uh, open it up uh, for you guys to, to think about stuff. So Troy, you had said in your, you had one of your slides talking about metaphysical naturalism, right? In some sense that all we, the notion that uh, we believe sort of the world or the universe is all that we can see the way it is. But you're at the same time, you're a scientist, right? So um, in other words, you put value on things you could measure and quantify and somehow, right? Maybe it's not 100% as you're saying like math possibly, but at least you, you have this. But if you believe that there's more to this world than what we can measure, right? Or what we can quantify using the tools we have, which is in the natural world, how, how can you measure those things? In other words, how can you put trust in things that you claim are outside of the world that are not measurable? So, um, okay, Sean, okay. You can hear me? 
It's Manuk Sakaya. Yeah. So, um, in ter so the there's a you know, how, so how, so your question is you know how do I if if you know if as a scientist I spend a lot of time studying the measurable things the physical world how do I how can I sort of also at the same time place trust in something that's outside of the measurements. Um, you know, I think one of the things that comes from this is, you know, I, I would agree more or less with what, what Leo said, which is that, you know, science leads me to the sense, you know, nothing is entirely certain. Uh, I think there's some, in some sense, the, the motivation for metaphysical naturalism is a misconception that somehow, you know, science is explaining more and more and more things, there's fewer and fewer unexplained things, and eventually, you know, the eventual complete hypothesis is just that everything is, you know, is all that, what we can see is all that there is. Uh, and that's certainly not the actual narrative of science. I mean, as we discover more things, there are more unanswered questions that we discover. Uh, and there's more, every bit of data that I gather results in more data that I can't explain. Uh, there's some data that I can, but there's always more, I've always added more to the pile of data that I can't explain. Um, and so, and so certainly there is, you know, if you want to say from a physical perspective, is there some gap there where God could be? Yes, but I think more, but I don't really think that God exists only in those gaps. I think, I think God also, you know, anything that's supernatural also works through the natural laws that we're observing. Um, so by measuring them and so forth, we find out something. And I think that, you know, certainly the existence of these laws and the order of the universe, you know, one of the things that uh, Eugene Wigner said is he described the unreasonable accuracy of mathematics. Uh, so the fact that math is so good at describing the universe is somewhat unreasonable to expect a priori unless there was some, something that set it up that way. Um, so I think there are certainly hints there. They're, they're not conclusive. It's not as if, you know, you, you, it bowls you over and you say you have to believe this. Uh, but I certainly see that, you know, there's, there's a compatibility there between what we find in science and what we would expect to find there if you had some sort of a theistic worldview. How are you? Good. Good. Um, Great. Does this, does this work? Check, yeah. check. There's a, okay. there's a British author who um, I really admire, and he, in one, of his, uh, in one of his writings, he writes these words. He writes, I don't believe in God, but I miss him. Right. I think he sort of gets to the point that, uh, although he's an atheist, right, there's this notion of, uh, of something bigger going on as a human, right? And he doesn't know sort of how to put his hands on there, but yet he sees these, you know, this, this bigger thing. Do you ever, do you agree with that statement? Do you feel like, uh, like how would you respond if, if, you know, Julian had said this or if you'd read that? Yeah, I think that's an important question. I, in my life, I do experience occasionally, but it's rare. I do experience things that are much bigger than myself. Actually, um, maybe right now it's a little apropos to say uh, we're, we're sort of in the midst or towards the tail end of... Uh, uh, Passover, and Passover is one of my favorite holidays, even though I'm completely secular, uh, for the reason that it makes me feel like I'm part of something bigger, part of history. And there's a history that stretches, it's a history that stretches back quite a long way. So for example, the Last Supper, um, I, at least according to three of the synoptic, the three synoptic gospels, uh, the Last Supper was uh, the Passover Seder. Um, and even back then, even back in Jesus' time, when he sat at the Seder, it was an ancient holiday. It was at least a thousand years older than that. And, so, and yet, a lot of the traditions have remained the same. So for me, when I participate in an event like this, it makes me feel like something, part of something really big and something, something good. I feel the same way when I discover something unexpected in mathematics. I feel the same way when I... Uh, when I uh, sometimes when I'm playing the viola in a certain passage, suddenly I just feel this in intense power. And it's not my power, but it's something else outside of me. Um, and, and, and like I said, I've had these transcendent experiences in nature as well. And so I get those experiences of feeling like I'm part of something bigger. And there's something, out something outside of me which is much larger. And I think that's a wonderful feeling. I just don't see it as connected in any way to a religious experience. That's the difference. I just, I, it doesn't, the, the, the link isn't obvious to me between those two. The sensation that I'm experiencing, and then somehow there's God. I don't know. Um, maybe I can just uh, turn questions to each other. Do you have a question maybe for, maybe for Troy? Or Troy, maybe you have a question for Leah you guys can ask each other and then? Sure, I have, I have a question. Uh, so, do you box? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. 
maybe we should go back to that. <laughs> okay, so uh, the, uh, the real question is, um, in your approach to faith, so you take it as a certainty in some way. So uh, does that come with evidence or is that in spite of or ir ir independent of evidence? Right. So I think, uh, so I think that, that you and I maybe don't have, I mean, so you, know, you had said that you think that certainty doesn't exist. I think you and I don't have such different conceptions. I think there's something, some things about the word, like I would use the word certainty to describe it. You might choose something else. I think in the sense that you're, you would define certainty as saying certainty is the absence of doubt, then I would agree that there's no such thing as certainty. I mean, like, you know, I say I'm certain that Christianity is true, but that doesn't mean I don't doubt sometimes. Well, you know, did Jesus really rise from the dead? That sounds pretty implausible, uh, you know, so there are doubts that coexist with that. Um, so in, if, if you're going to use certainty in the sort of uh, enlightenment sense of certainty where it's like, okay, there's doubt, there's certainty, there are the enemies, certainty is the only the absence of doubt, then that's something that I never achieve ever in anything. Um, so when I was using certainty to describe it, it's, you know, we can maybe use, we could use the word conviction, we could use the word assurance, something. Just to clarify, sorry, so what about the very basic axioms, you know, God exists, the Bible is inerrant, that sort of yes, thing. Yes, so I, mean, so I you question I, all of those things. Uh, yes, I, I, so yes, so I certainly had so the very basic things, like there are times where I'm like, is that really true or am I just deluding myself? Um, you know, do I believe it because it makes me feel good or something like that? Um, so, so it's not as if those doubts magically go away. Someone may wave their magic wand on me and turned off that part of my brain. Like it's like, you know, it, those, those parts of my brain still work and still ask questions and still doubt. And, you know, I still think about those things. Um, and the question of evidence really is, is also important because, you know, I think that, you know, because when you have those doubts, the evidence is the thing that you go back to. Um, you know, you say, well, okay, what evidence do I have? Where do I go for the, you know, and, and it's, so it's not as if the evidence is ever going to be conclusive. It's ever going to wipe away all the doubts, but you go back to saying, well, is there some evidence? How do I, you know, how can I be at least somewhat confident? And if I come up with, if I keep go, if I go through the evidence, I find something that really ca causes me to wor be worried, then that's going to say, okay, well, maybe those doubts are really pretty valid. Um, and I think, you know, you touched on this with some of the things about like interpretation of scripture and these kinds of things about how, you know, the world, there were many Christians who thought the world was flat um, and would probably point to some part in scripture where they, you know, would, you know, say that. Um, and then it turns out they're wrong. Um, and, and if, but if, you know, if you ignore, if you try to say, well, you know, I just go straight with that, then you would just ignore the evidence. But, you know, you have to, you have to incorporate the evidence and think about, okay, well, you know, what, how, how would this evidence potentially change what I believe or what I think? Um, yeah. Sure. Uh, so I have to pick. So I was making notes. Um, so, um, so okay. So, but so then getting to the the idea. You so you said you love you know uncertainty and those kinds of things. You know the thing that always fascinates fascinates me about that is that you know life f forces us to decide things. You know, at, you know, you have to decide if you're going to go to temple tomorrow, um, for example, or not tomorrow, uh, day after tomorrow. Um, but you have to make that decision, uh, and and you're you know you're not certain whether it's a good thing or not. You know, you're 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 like okay, I'm agnostic, I'm in the middle, I don't know if it's going or not. But you have to make a decision about whether you're going to go to temple. Um, and so, and you and so you you had made a statement that you said okay, well, or. I'm not going. I'm not going to try to pin you on it, but you said something. But something along the long lines, you know, we, we make decisions based on what we're more confident about. Um, and I guess I just want to say, okay, well, so how do you how do you make those? I mean, is, is it literally for you just probabilistics? In other words, I, I think this is probably more true or not. Or are there ever times where you say, okay, the other thing is more probably true, but I'm still going to go with this? Are there ever circumstances where you could see yourself doing that? So uh, if I'm conscious of the probabilities, then I would go with the probabilities. Now it's a different question that a lot of the time I'm just not conscious of why I think the way I do and why I th I'm more confident in something. And when that happens, my choice is made on a largely irrational basis. And I think a lot of my choices are made, unfortunately, on a largely irrational basis. But as much as possible, I'm trying to identify in myself when that is, what it is that I take for granted, question that and make it more explicit so that the next time the choice comes up or a similar one comes up, I can, uh, I can make a more informed choice. And so I guess along those, just to follow up that, so, so on the things where you're, you're saying that you are fundamentally uncertain or you just 
don't think you can know. Yeah. How does that play out for you? Yeah, so again, every time I make a choice, I think to myself, was that really the right choice definitively? And I have to play it out. And I play it out over and over again. And that makes me a neurotic Jew. But I, I guess this is, you know, that's, that's uh, I think that that process is important, not just in terms of decisions, but also just in terms of, you know, everything that, uh, everything that I believe. Because I, I want to be on as sure footing as I can, and yet I don't have any sure footing. But I want to understand things as well as I can, and in the process, I also want to improve myself better, and so improve myself. So, I don't know. I don't know exactly how to respond to that okay. question. I guess I, I, I certainly do not make always consistent or logical decisions. So, for example, I, uh, as I told you, I, I'm here. I am in this debate, even though I originally questioned uh, Sathian's participation in the same type of debates. So, um, when I initially questioned him, I think that was a very valid thing. And when I got the invitation to participate, I also questioned that in my, for myself as well. And in the end, I decided that maybe there was more benefit to participating than not. But am I sure of that? Certainly not. So I'm going to continue asking these guys questions. But if you have any, uh, there's a microphone on either side. I'd love for you guys to just come on up and kind of stand there awkwardly. And then I will uh, use my powers to point on either side. Uh, but w while you guys are doing that, I just thought we could kind of keep continuing our, our conversation. If something you know, comes to your mind, or even if you feel embarrassed, uh, but the person next to you isn't, you know, maybe they could you know, ask that question for you. Uh, how, how about this question while these guys are thinking about coming up? Um, maybe I'll start with you, Troy. But what annoys you or frustrates you the most in the way other people view your worldview? You know, is there something that you would like to clear up? It, you know, usually people think of the label Christian, or maybe agnostic or atheist. Like, it's like, man, I wish they could get past X. Is there something like that, that uh, that's a stumbling block you think for others? Um, so what, what annoys me the most? And I'm uh, going to ask you the same question, Leo. Right? So, I, I, I guess what annoys me the most is that people uh, associate Christianity with a political viewpoint. Um, a particular political viewpoint. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily political on very far. The Green Party? Was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah we're all Tea Party. No, 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 uh, Tea Party actually is what a lot of people assume. Um, but um, I'm not particularly extreme on any side of the, the political spectrum. But the, the only time that I can think of that I, was, I felt singled out as a Christian at MIT was, was after the 2004 presidential election when one of my colleagues turned to me and said, Troy, you're probably the only person who understands how people could still be voting for George Bush. Just assuming that because I was a Christian that I would be able to interpret for him why people vote for George Bush. Um, and I was like, no, I, I can't speak for everyone on that, sorry. Um, so, uh. Leo, what do you think, my friend? Uh, is there something that when the word atheism or you know, an atheist or an agnostic is thrown around, you just kind of wish like you could step in and say, I'd love, a little, let me clarify this thing a little bit. Yeah, that's, that's a really nice question, actually. Um, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. So I guess one thing, one, one uh, misunderstanding that people sometimes have is that atheism is, uh, is a strong belief. That it's, uh, it's as strong a belief as, uh, as Christianity is. And I think that may be true for some people. Uh, I'm not sure that that's true in general. So for me, if I were, and this is not an original thought, but, uh, but if I were to tell you, for example, that there are pink elephants on Mars, then until I'd said that, you wouldn't have believed in it just by virtue of having been never thought about it. It's just a question of ignorance. Your default is to disbelieve in the existence of pink elephants on Mars. Now, as soon as I say that, then you can start thinking about it, maybe, and you can decide on something. But, um, but the default before you've conceived of this question is not to believe in it. So I'm actually technically an agnostic in the sense that I don't know. I have no idea what the truth is. I'm not even sure there is a truth. I don't know whether there is a meaning of life. I don't know what that question means. I don't know if it's a real question. But, um, but day to day, I'm effectively an atheist in the sense that my default is I don't believe in Christianity 
mainly because it's just not something that I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's somehow a theory on top of something. And as soon as it's a theory on top of something, my default position is I disbelieve it. And that's actually, I, we never really got there, but that's one of the, f I think, one of the fundamental approaches, scientific approaches, is to automatically disbelieve something first. That's sort of the default, is to disbelieve things. And then you change, you change your beliefs as you gather more evidence and see things. Maybe we'll start with a question here and then and go over here. Um, so the uh, question is for, for um, Troy. Um, so I saw your, I interpreted the whole Sally story as kind of a metaphor for like, you know, bacon. Yeah, it wasn't a real story. Right. <laughs> bacon could be um, right something that, you know, when you cross a metaphorical bridge, something good happens. And if you don't, well, something bad, you starve. And, you know, whether the bacon is, you know, um, heaven or just self-improvement, um, but I was wondering where that certainty comes from for you, because I think Leo would say something like, um, like the Sally could calculate, you know, like how old is the bridge, and then also like how much am I, how likely am I gonna die of starvation if I don't cross? Or so where yeah. does that certainty come right. from? Right. So. Um so, the, so certainly calculating probabilities in that scenario is one way you could go about it. But the thing that's, that's interesting and the reason I use a person and a decision and bacon and stuff like that is because Sally's not going to experience the average. She's not going to experience the probabilities. Either the bridge is going to collapse or it's not. Uh, so even if she can say it's 95% certain that this bridge is going to hold me, if the 5% comes up, it was a bad decision. Um, and even if it was only 1% likely to hold her, if she manages to get across, it was a good decision. Um, and so we don't actually, ex so the fact that we don't experience life probabilistically is the reason that I think that, that this is, that, so that's sort of why we can't just say, oh, well, let's just go with the probabilities, you know? I mean, there are plenty of people who don't fly on planes, even though probabilistically they're safe. They're like, but that, there's that small chance that it's not. And if I experience that small chance, then it's 100% bad for me to fly. Um, and um, you, so they, they say, okay, well, where do I get this, this certainty or this confidence? Um, you know, I think that, you know, so if you, give, if you take an example of flying on a plane, you know, if you're afraid of flying, where do you get enough confidence to overcome that fear and fly? Um, it's got to come from somewhere. Um, you know, maybe it's somebody who agrees to fly with you and holds your hand. Maybe it's someone who, I mean, it's, I think it's unlikely, but it could be somebody who goes over all the statistics of plane crashes and convinces you that, that it's unlikely. Um, you know, it could be, you know, there's various things that you could use to try to get to the point where you feel confident enough that you can fly on the plane. Um, and, and that is the role of faith in Christianity, which is to say, look, you may have some evidence to believe something, but how do you get to that point of confidence where you say, I'm actually going to act in a way that's consistent with that belief? When am I going to actually get, I might say, okay, yes, planes are fine, but I'm not going to fly. Um, and then, you know, how do you get to that point of actually saying, okay, I believe that they're not, it's not going to crash, and so I'm going to get on the plane. Um, and so, for me, that, that confidence, that certainty comes from, uh, I mean, I, I, my, 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 you know, you can ask where did it come from, but for me it comes from a supernatural source. Um, that, 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 that faith, that confidence is given to us um, when we ask for it. So. so just to respond to that quickly, I thought it was interesting that in your examples, uh, the two examples you gave before also describing the third example with faith, uh, the inspiration to convince you to go on this plane trip that you're scared of came externally from some external source. Um, and I don't think that's necessary. I'm not sure that that's necessary. I don't know. And certainly, in the case of flying on planes, maybe it's not necessary for it to come externally. Maybe it's possible to convince yourself with a lot of hard effort to to do that. Yeah, and so within that within that context, I think you know um, that's certainly something that I, that is appealing, particularly within American culture. You know that it's like sell, you know it's like r you know rugged self improvement. That's what we're all about, right? Um, but I think there's a, f that if it really is something that has to, so the, the real question is, could it come externally? You know, it's like, okay, well, maybe it could come internally, but is there anything external that could give it to you? Or is it just basically internal to you or maybe to other people, but basically still, you know, internal? Um, because there's a fundamental unfairness to it then. Because 
different, so like, you know, if you say, okay, well, my faith to act out this particular moral, you know, moral code or something like that is going to come internally. Well, different people have different upbringings and different, you know, home lives and so forth. And for some of them, it may be ex insanely difficult to behave morally. It just may be really, really hard. Um, and if there's any kind of moral code, it's my belief that there is some moral standard that we're expected to, you know, get up to. And if it's insanely difficult for one person and really easy for somebody else, that's unjust. It's unfair. And it's not very encouraging worldview to say, well, you know, it sucks to be you because you, can't, you, have, you have all these obstacles in your place. Having, so in that sense, the external aspect of things is important to me because I, love to, I believe in the equality of people and the equipotential of people, that everyone has the ability to reach this, this standard. Um, and the idea that it's internal, I would seriously question whether everybody actually does have the ability. But if there's something external that can come in and help, then yeah, we should box. Okay. okay. Uh, on the side, question. Yeah. Uh, so my question is for Professor Goldmacher um, about the issue of morality, actually, that uh, you bring up. So uh, you were talking about, briefly, I think, what you consider moral and immoral. Um, and I could be wrong, and if you can correct me, but I think the issue of morality in the Judeo-Christian faith is not only well-defined, but pretty concrete. Um, I don't think it's something that changes across time. Um, whereas I, it seems as though your definition of what is moral and immoral is very fluid. Um, so I'm wondering like, how, I guess, is morality something that's concrete for you? Is it a changing definition? Um, and where does it come from? That's, that's a great question. I, I actually think that uh, I'm sort of in agreement with a lot of the Christians that I've discussed this point with, which is, and this is what I tried to bring up also, that uh, the question of what is moral changes depending on the context. So the things that I brought up, and you're right, it's very concretely laid out in the Bible, what's moral and what's not moral, and some of those things are now not considered moral. I mean, I think you would be hard pressed, for example, to argue that beating your children with rods is moral, and yet it's right there, very concretely, it's in Proverbs. Um, so if you want to insist on sticking to first century morality in the 21st century, you know, great, do that. Um, but I'm not sure that that's fantastic for society as a whole. So I, my belief in morality, I think Christians cherry pick to some extent what should be, what sort of, what sort, what were the good ideas from that time that still apply to our current society? And what were the ideas that are less applicable to our current society? And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, I do that all the time as well. I think a lot of people do this all the time. And uh, so yeah, I don't know if this answers your question. Yeah, yeah. But So my, my personal morality is fairly fluid, but I, I don't think that's actually a distinction necessarily from a Christian, but feel free to correct me. Question on this side? Sure. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank both of you gentlemen for the even-handed way that you presented your views. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Goldmacher, I was very intrigued by uh, your description of uh, observing the starry host in the Negev. That was, that was a beautiful description. Um, and I, I can appreciate uh, that the awe it inspired in you subjectively uh, didn't have a religious uh, quality or overtone to it. Uh, but if we, if we look at that same panorama from a more objective viewpoint, um, I think it begs the question, and I'd like to get your, your opinion on this, um, where did all that come from in the first place, and, and why do you suppose that there is something instead of nothing? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a biggie. Um, <laughs> so first of all, objectively, I think what that is is a bunch of uh, very highly heated gas and empty space. Um, and rocks, but uh, taking that uh, aside for a second, where did it come from? The answer is I don't know. I have no idea. But um, I have to say that the answers that I've heard from Christianity I haven't found convincing. That's the one thing that I will say. Um, but I have no idea where it came from. I don't even know if that's a question that we'll ever be able to answer with science. But certainly I think science, it's potentially possible for science to answer that question. I don't know if it will. I don't know if it is possible. But so it's an unsatisfying answer. But I'm, as I, again, my, my main point is I'm content 
to live with this uncertainty. It doesn't bother me not knowing, not having a theory to explain things. I'm okay with that. So I don't know if that's satisfying enough, but thanks. Question on the side. Uh, so, Professor Goldmacher, um, one thing that really struck out to me when you were talking is your, kind of what you were just saying, the excitement that you kind of have in the unknown. Um, and I'm a Christian, and actually for me, I found that knowing God uh, there's, is exciting and the unknown continues. Like, the idea that actually we don't think we have it totally figured out, um, and I believe in him and excited to go through this and, and uncover the mysteries on a daily basis that for me, I believe will last in eternity, literally. And so it's this, ex I mean, ex joy that I can't even explain really that uh, I, it's just, it's a continuous unfolding of the mysteries myself. And so I guess I have questions for each of you. Um, for you, do you think that your perception of Christianity is that uh, Christians do think they have it figured out, kind of takes the fun aspect out of life, things like that, um, and how that, how that plays, or takes the excitement out of um, the unknown. And for you, Troy, do you relate to what I'm saying at all? Like, what are, what are your feelings on that? Uh, let's start with Troy, and yeah, then maybe you can, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I certainly relate to, to what, you're, what you were saying. I mean, the, one of the previous questioners, you know, um, you know, use the word awe, the sense of awe, of awe. And I mean, I, if I was one fundamental emotion that I feel about God, it's awe um, and, and wonder about, okay, well, you know, there's all, you know, while we may feel like there's many things that we know in Christianity, there's infinitely more that we don't. Um, and in fact, one of my favorite if you want a very short book uh, on Christianity that you can read, uh, there's a book by J.B. Phillips called Your God is Too Small um, that just goes through 10 different ways that your view of God is probably smaller than God actually is. Um. Neil? So um, I'm actually not arguing against Christianity so much. Um, I, I think if it works for you and it gives you that sense of awe and you're living your life and you're fulfilled and you're satisfied in that, I think that's a wonderful thing. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I'm not trying to be condescending. I just, I think what works for you and what works for me are different things. Um, so I certainly do believe that Christianity and belief and faith gives people this feeling of transcendence and awe and wonder and excitement. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, I've just been able to find other sources of it. I, I don't, I, I'm not sure that Religion is the only source of that. So I'm going to pause from your questions just for a second and ask you guys a question that I was thinking about is, how do you deal with competing worldviews? Right, so your answer is at least maybe partly was um, if it works for you. Uh, maybe, that, maybe you want to think about it a little bit more, but what I mean is, you know, if somebody comes up to me as a math professor and says, well, you know, I feel like one plus one is seven, I would actually say, dude, I don't care what it works for you, that you're wrong, right? I, I'd be happy to take him to the mat and tell him, and you guys are both scientists and mathematicians, like you certainly believe Gauss Bonnet. You know, there are these truths that you know is true, and same thing as a chemist, right? So in one hand, the world is offering a lot of competing views, right, in terms of what is true, what is right, miracles or not miracles. And at the same time, we realize that we don't have all the answers. So is there, maybe you guys can take turns just answering, like how do you deal with the notion of measurable truth somehow, but at the same time, these competing worldviews? Is it just relativism, like let you guys, let everybody choose what they want, or is there something more? Is it okay if I... So, um, I think the relativism is okay on questions to which we don't know the answers. So for example, you know, to be a Christian or not, I think that's a perfectly reasonable thing to be a Christian or not to be a Christian. I don't know the answer to that question, whether which one is right. So I certainly wouldn't argue against it. Um, your example with mathematics is interesting because it's actually, why is one plus one not seven? It's actually axiomatic, essentially. So it's not true because of some deep reason. It's true because we decreed it to be so. We declared it to be so. And that's one of the ways in which math is very different from science. In that math, you start with a certain explicit set of ground rules, and then you play your game according to those rules. And if you say, well, those rules are wrong, that's fine. That's okay. You're just playing a different game. So you can make up your own rules, go for it, you know, change the rules. Maybe parallel lines intersect after all. That's a different game, but it's a perfectly valid game to play. Unless it gives contradictions. But, 
Yeah, so uh, I don't know if that really answers the question. So. Right, so I mean, we could certainly come up with worldviews or answers to some of these unanswered questions. We would say, well, no, that that's not okay. Um, just, you know, just out of hand. I think some of it is, you know, when we have academic debates where well, we're talking about Judaism versus Christianity, worldviews that we've sort of vetted and think are okay. But there are some worldviews out there that are just, we would just say, well, we don't, no, that's not okay. Context. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's just, it, but it's, you know, and I think that, and this is one of the things that I think has, has really sort of undermined relativism as an academic discipline is that people have realized that relativism doesn't actually work um, like as, as a sort of universal philosophy. It's like you, you selectively apply relativism and say, well, these things are okay and these are not. Um, and so, you know, if, if I was to say, how do I, you know, I, you know, I do like to be, you know, accepting and discussing, you know, other worldviews with other people. I think the one one thing that's, you know, that's difficult about Christianity is it always does come back to the person of Christ, um, which is, you know, okay, well, most people agree he would seem like a pretty nice guy. Um, he seemed to like be pretty smart. He knew some things and stuff. But then you ultimately have to ask, you know, well, okay, and then he have d suffered this horrible death that he probably didn't deserve. So what was the point of that? So that's the sort of fundamental point of Christianity. Was he just sort of an, an, an unmisunderstood guy, nice guy, martyr for a cause, but not more than that? Or was there something more involved in that? And that is really the axiomatic point on Christianity that says, okay, well, you've got to make a decision on that. Yeah, but already in that question, what was the point of that? I see a problem. So, so some questions sound like questions, but it's not obvious that they are questions. So let me give you a mathematical example, because um, everyone loves math. Um, so if, uh, yeah, some people in the back. So for example, if I say, you know, if I talk about the square root of two, none of you will be shocked by this idea, the square root of two. Sure, it's just some number, right? But actually, if you think about it, it's not a number, it's wishful thinking. I'm saying, wouldn't it be nice if there's some number that when I square it, I get two? And that might strike you as sort of trivial and obvious, but if I say, what is the square root of orange? Suddenly, it's less obvious. I'm asking a perfectly valid question. Is there a number whose square is orange? Or orange, depending on where you're from. But, uh, but Either way, it sounds like a real question, but it's not a real question. It's not necessarily meaningful. Just because it's grammatical and involves objects and words that you understand doesn't make it an actually valid, legitimate question. And so when you say, what was the point of that? That might be a legitimate question. But even the legitimacy of that as a question, I'm not convinced of. Right, so, uh, but I, in, the, in the specific example of Christ's death on the cross, another way to phrase it would be, what did that accomplish? Um, which is His death. Yeah, so is it just, he died? Is that it? Um, and if that's it, then, you know, that says something fairly profound about the Christian worldview. Um, and, you know, and, and then, you know, and doesn't necessarily say something profound about Judaism or Islam, but something fairly profound about Christianity. And then if you say that there was something else that was accomplished there, then that's something that is not shared by any of the other worldviews. So then there is this sort of dichotomy of relativism. You can't just say, okay, well, it's all of them at the same time. No, you've got to make a choice. Or the third option, that accomplishment is a false word in that context. But in terms of moral relativism, let me just say one more word, and then I know, I know we have other questions. Um, in terms of moral relativism, uh, I totally agree with you. I think that belief, for me, belief in whatever you want is fine as long as it doesn't impose on other people. And that's, for me, the, the, big, the big question. Does your belief impose on other people? Belief in Christianity does impose on me in an indirect way in the sense that, for example, if we vote into office someone who is Christian, then they're at least closer to changing laws than I am, and maybe they're influenced by their beliefs. Everyone is. I'm certainly influenced by my beliefs, so I would assume others are as well. So, um, uh, so in some sense, it does influence all of us, but in this, in this case, my morals largely agree with the morality that I'm sort of, uh, of the Christians that I've talked to at least, which is a very small sample size. But So in that sense, even if it imposes on me, I don't, uh, it doesn't bother me as much. Question. Okay. Um, well, on uh, the square root of oranges, I'm sure there are at least a few other students in the room who know that the square root of onions is shallots. It's a well-known fact. Um, <laughs> but moving on for that, back to, um, between different worldviews. This is a question for Troy mostly. So if we start from your, um, like your premise maybe, like looking at the, how the world works, it looks like there's 
a god in the the gaps, and you could see that there's a there could be a god as the in in the details as well. It's mm -hmm. it's there in all of it. Um, and starting from that premise that there is a, a supernatural, um, how do you what what leads you to Christianity specifically? Is there evidence taking you there, or um, is it a leap? And what makes you make that leap rather than Judaism or Islam or whatever? Right. So the so the. The specifics of so it's interesting because largely speaking, the the in terms of the general things, you know, like physical laws of nature and stuff, those don't lead you specifically to Christianity. Um, it's you know they're consistent with Judaism, they're consistent with Islam. It's not consistent with every religion. Um, there are certain Eastern religions that would posit you know other physical forces in nature that we've observed don't exist and therefore would be difficult to re reconcile with science. But you know, there's still several worldviews on the table if you just accept laws of nature. And so what would push you towards Christianity are the sort of specifics. So there's sort of these sort of specific things that don't, you know, that aren't laws of nature. Um, and you know, one of the, the key examples of this are, are, are miracles. Um, so miracles, things that happened one time, they're irreproducible. So you can't come back and scientifically test, did this happen? You can scientifically test it and say it probably didn't have to happen because I tried it a hundred times and it didn't happen again. But that's the sort of point of the miracle is that it happened once and it doesn't happen repeatedly. Um, and, and then, so they're, they're, the miracles are one of the evidential pieces for Christianity that things, that things hinge on. In other words, what do you think about those? Do you think that you know, some of these things actually happened? If so, then I think that's fairly convincing towards the one direction, but at the same time, you know, you're free to say, well, I don't think any of those things happened. I think they're sort of false reports or, you know, various, you know, various other reasons for those, those accounts. And then the other thing is, of, is personal experience. So I've had experiences, you know, like the sort of transcendental experience of God and the negative, that, that, that you, you're not of God, but the transcendental experience you had in the negative, but that for your friend John, you said you felt confident was he had associated with God and you didn't. And I've had various experiences with, like that. And there you have to sort of sit down and say, okay, well, those experiences, which ones of those ones that are still on the table is, are my experiences consistent with? Um, and, and I've sort of, you know, in my analysis, I've said, okay, well, really they're only consistent with the Christian, with, with what Christianity predicts things would be like. Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, just for the sake of time, maybe one last question. I'm going to ask for closing comments from these guys a little bit. Uh, this is for Troy. Um, in a lot of ways, it seemed like sort of the crux of your argument was that Christianity is useful rather than maybe necessarily true. Um, and I was wondering... Uh, to what degree do you think faith comes from the usefulness of faith? And whether or not that's really what your argument was, that it was actually useful and helps you get on planes and right. like. Right, so that's a really, really good question because I think that ultimately I think that Christianity is both useful and true. Um, so I think it is both. Uh, I focus on the usefulness because it's the thing that is closer to me. Um, so truth is in some sense removed from me. So, you know, the truth, that if, we're, if we're talking about truth, I'm going to restrict when you say whether it's true, I'm going to restrict that to an, to an objective sense. Of, you know, are the, the factual statements of, say, the Apostles' Creed or something like that, are they correct? So that's an objective truth. And then there's the question of how does that objective truth come through the ages, things that may have happened thousands of years ago, how do they come through the ages and actually change, how do they matter at all uh, now? And I think that those two things of whether it's useful and whether it's true are related. Uh, because if it's true, then some of the things that were said back then will be useful now and true now. Um, and so that's one of the ways that I get to actually examine the truth of the older statements, which is to say, you know, you, if you say, okay, you know, Jesus makes certain statements about himself and you come, and come forward and you try to test them um, by following along those commandments or something along those lines. If it doesn't play out the way that it was predicted for it to play out, then you start to say, hmm, maybe that original statement isn't true. Um, and then, because the other, the other piece is, of course, historical scholarship and scientific scholarship on the, histor on the sort of, to the extent to which we can validate any historical claims about Christianity, there is scholarly research that does that. I didn't necessarily emphasize that because, you know, as Leo said, I am certainly not a historian uh, and I don't have the academic chops to really make the case about, you know, whether the, how good the academic scholarship is. I can say that I've, I've investigated as a sort of non-historian, so that's something that's interesting to me in that sense, um, but, and, and, and found it to be you know, fairly solid scholarship of several points of Christianity, 
being valid. Um, but just by itself, if I just had that, if I just had the historical scholars who said, well, this might be right, that wouldn't be enough by itself. And if I just had the idea that it was useful, that wouldn't be enough by itself. You need to have both of those things together. So I do want to say that uh, as we uh, wrap up a little bit, these guys are going to be sticking around afterwards. I know some of you guys didn't have a chance to answer questions. Uh, Troy can't stick around too much because he's driving back home, uh, back to MIT. Uh, but he'll be here for a little bit. But uh, Leo and I and a couple others will be, will be hanging out afterwards. So uh, please, uh, please stick around. Uh, as I just wanted to close, uh, give these guys a chance to maybe say uh, a sentence or two about, about a closing thought. But I would like for you to maybe also answer a question of mine, which is maybe I'll wrap it, wrap it up in there, which is what do you think it would take to change your mind from your current perspective? Because both of you guys are scientists, mathematicians, and both of you guys have sort of agreed today that there's a no notion of certainty, right? Like neither of you are going to say 100% I'm in. This is clear. Right? There's this notion of certainty. So say right now the certainty is 80-20 or 90-10. What do you think it'll, what is needed in your life to tilt it over? Uh, to kind of say and embrace the Christian faith or to say, you know what, this is, this is not making sense to me. Maybe you can close in, in that kind of an idea. Um, so Troy, you want to yeah. go first and then Leo close it up? So I mean, I think I can, I can uh, wrap, that, wrap that up in that, you know, Leo shared a little bit about his, you know, his background. You know, I can share a little bit about mine, which is, I mean, I was raised, I was raised in a Christian household, um, but when I was in college, about the age many of you guys are, uh, I left the church, I stopped going, and I said, you know, this isn't for me. Uh, and so I, so what was it that made me say that? You know, I think that's the key question. Um, and, and for me, it was the, 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 the overwhelming sensation that, okay, I still, you know, probably seem to believe that God existed, but it didn't seem like he was really present or paying attention at all. Like, there were lots of things going on, and it seems like, you're God, God, you're not paying attention to any of this. You don't seem to care. And if so, why should I bother paying attention to you? Um, and so I don't know that it necessarily made me disbelieve in the existence of God, but it made me dis disbelieve in the tenets of Christianity that, you know, God was actively involved and did things and so forth. It was like, okay, well, maybe he's abstractly there in some sense, but he clearly is letting me do whatever I want and letting other people do whatever they want to me. And so if that's the case, then I'm not going to waste two hours a week going to church. Um, and, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Sorry, that, that seems to answer the wrong question, though, which is not, not how you, what con would convert you away from Christianity, but Sethian's question was what would what would now convert you away from Christianity. Right, so, I mean that, so, that, so yeah, so that's the, so it, it's, I think that's the one example that I can think of, because, you know, you say, that I can think of, which is that, you know, I, I currently have, a, you know, I've had other experiences made me think, like, actually, God is involved and cares about what's going on here. But if I was somehow convinced that that's not actually true, that, you know, it was either my delusion or my false, false understanding of that, and that God, at best, is some watchmaker who exists far away, and I'd be like, you know, that's, that seems, you know, so it, it is important to me that God is active and that he cares about what's going on in this room right now and in our lives and all of those things. I mean, it's not the only and central point of Christianity, but it's the one piece that I can tangibly test um, here and now. Well, I think that's, uh, I've been thinking about the answer to this question. Uh, and the answer is, I don't know, actually. Um, maybe... A burning bush, but honestly, even uh, so, even in the in the case that, for example, I suddenly saw a burning bush and a voice emanated from it, uh, some extreme event like this, I would have to question: Is that someone playing a practical joke? Is that uh, m some something has gone wrong with me? Maybe I'm experiencing hallucinations. But certainly the thought would enter into my mind that there's a possibility that there's another explanation. And so which of those explanations is more likely really depends on the event that uh, sort of the catalyst for it. But, uh, but certainly the thought would enter my mind more strongly if some supernatural event, in other words, an event for which I had no clean, even remote explanation for occurred, that would force me to start thinking more carefully. Um, were these our closing comments or no? I just wanted to say one last thing, I guess, about this then, then uh, which is that the original question was, is science enough? And I never really answered that in my, in my talk, so I'm going to answer it now. Um, I think it depends on the person. And this sounds like moral relativism again, but for me, so far, I've found it enough. I've found it fulfilling. I've found it enough in my life. For other people, 
for example, the person who asked the, the question, or for Troy, it seems like, um, it's not enough. And so, which one of those is the right answer? I don't, I don't know, I just think it really, it is context specific. What, what's enough for one person isn't enough for another. I just think it's, uh, it's brave for these gentlemen here to kind of talk about issues that they might not have 100% nailing on, right? They're kind of struggling with and walking through these things. So can you join me in thanking them for today? For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.